think about Genesis, we think of how the Bible begins with this massive information dump, 50 chapters, the God just expounds His greatness and His glory right out of the gate in the book of Genesis. Many of us know Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but we begin to read along and sometimes those passages become less familiar to us. There's genealogies, there's begats after begat after begat, and there's all these kind of things, and there's this this overflow of history and individuals and sin and debauchery that doesn't always sound familiar to us. In fact, we heard about those stories growing up, maybe in Sunday school or in the church. We hear radio Bible preachers talk about them and various other things, but are they really familiar to us? And maybe a bigger question we have is, what is God doing in all of this? Well, to back up just for a moment, to understand the book of Genesis is really to, to understand how it's structured. I believe Moses wrote the book of Genesis. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. Jesus seems to think that. Uh, the Bible seems to give us that indication in many places. But as Moses is writing that, he presents the book of Genesis primarily in two big picture ideas. And the first is in chapters 1 through chapter 11. Some would call that primeval history, or this is uh, Israel's history before there was Israel. This is history before there was Abraham. So what was going on in those early days? What was going on even before the flood and before Noah's time and all of those things? And, and one of the important things that we see in those first 11 chapters is that this is the beginning of redemptive history that God is establishing His name in the world. He does that, first of all, in a new creation. He creates an earth, a universe. All of these things come into existence out of nothing. And He begins by making His presence known to a people, first to Adam and to his wife Eve. And He walks with them in the cool of the day and they know His presence and they see His presence and they're with Him. But then we know what happens in Genesis 3, and sin ensues, and sin comes not only to Adam and Eve. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5 that through Adam, sin infected the whole world, and that sin enters the world. And one of the tragic things that we see in Genesis that is still a mark on all of us today, even me, is that this sin has caused us to be, caused us to be driven from the presence of God. That is one of the resounding notes that we see throughout Genesis and even throughout the New Testament until we get to Jesus the Messiah. Now God is now making His presence known to us in the Messiah. He is now with us. He is God, Emmanuel, God with us. But in Genesis chapters 1 through 11, we see the beginning of redemptive history. And then we see that history begin to play out in Genesis chapters 12 through Genesis chapter 50. And we see that history played out first beginning in Abraham with covenant promises that are made to him and also to his lineage. There would be others, there would be sons, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and their sons and their grandsons and so on. And we are told some wonderful things that, in, for example, in Genesis 12, that through Abraham there will be a land, a seed, and a blessing, and that really focusing in on that blessing that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through this promised one. Well, who is that promised one? That brings us back to Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3.15, we are told there that there will be a male heir of Eve who will come and he will crush the head of the serpent who is Satan and he will bring an end to all this destruction, all this sin, all of this misery. And right there in Genesis 3, although very few details are known about this one, we learn right there that there's an anticipation that begins to build and it builds right on into Eve's history, even with the birth of her first son, maybe there's hope there. Maybe this firstborn son whose name came, maybe he's the one only to see those hopes and those dreams crushed and that we see that that firstborn son becomes a murderer. Well, maybe it's the other son. Well, that secondborn son is murdered by the firstborn son. So who will it be? And then we see another son born to Adam and Eve, and his name is Seth. And there we see a godly line established there in Genesis 5. And that line transcends not only the time before the flood, but even the time after the flood. And we see Noah and his grandsons who would come from that same godly line of Seth. And that traces us all the way through the history of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, all the way to the very end of Genesis, which really sets the tone and the theology for the rest of our Bibles. And then Genesis toward the end ends on a very wonderful note, a great anticipatory note. 
As Jacob is lying on his deathbed, he calls his sons to him and he gives blessings and he, he gives a glimpse into their future and what life will be like, not only for them as individuals, but for their lineage, their tribes, their nations that will come from them. And he says something to Judah. He says, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares, rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh, the Messiah, comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Right there we are told, in fulfillment of not only the promises previously made to Abraham, but right there the anticipation begins to build. Not only is a seed going to come from Eve and ultimately from Abraham and ultimately from all these sons and grandsons of Abraham, but in that seed there will also be kingship. And that king will not be over just a tribe or a few particular people in Israel, but it will be a, a, a king over all the nations. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through this great and coming king. And so Genesis sets the tone for the rest of Scripture. Who will be this one who will crush the head of the serpent, the, the head of Satan? Who will be this one who in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed? Who will be this one who will call a people for himself from every tribe and nation and tongue? Who will be this one from the tribe of Judah, a lion from the tribe of Judah, in whom the scepter, the kingship, will never depart and he will reign for all eternity? Those are the questions that we are given and told to ask in the book of Genesis. Those are the questions that are anticipated throughout the rest of Scripture. And as all of this comes full circle, we see that those questions are answered in the birth, in the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the return of Jesus the Messiah.